I want to give just a quick outline of what, what I plan to do. Today we're going to do a very brief uh, introduction and then I'm going to just briefly tell you the, uh, the methodological approach that we've taken in this study uh, with young people and, and uh, spaces in public libraries. Then I want to just give you a, just a brief uh, overview of the quantitative findings that we have uh, derived as well as a few of the qualitative findings. And then we'll talk more specifically about a particular topic seating and then we'll conclude with some general comments before Jeremy uh, talks. Uh, urban centers are reviving again, as we hear in the, uh, the uh, paper on a daily basis. Uh, moribund cities and commercial districts prior to 2000 are now uh, crackling and bubbling as resi residential centers with fashionable foodie nests and pulsing with exciting destination attractions and entertainments. Yet despite this urban renaissance so many of us have longed for, it's also a radically lopsided regeneration. Manifest, manifesting a decidedly anti-youth uh, urban regime. Um, the numbers tell a clear story about this, an age-based segregation increasingly swept clean of young people. Only 13% of this city's population is now under 18. In Seattle, it's 15%, 17% in Boston, whereas compared to the national average, it's about 24% of the city's population is populated by young people. In our rush to promote higher density urbanism, asks urbanist Cade Benfield, are we inadvertently creating child-free zones that are inhospitable to families with kids? If we are as committed to diversity as we like to say, shouldn't that include young people? And yet one institution of civic, civil society remains steadfast, even doubling down in its efforts to avoid this re-urbanized Jim Crow Jr., I call it, our own public libraries. Although libraries have traditionally been devoted heart and soul to children, over the past 15 years or so, and in terms of trying to try harder to offer young adults a space of their own, libraries have actually found another gear. But it's not a simple library as hero story either. In fact, it's a little unnerving, especially for uh, someone like me who's a researcher, that little of this recent YA space effort is advanced with demonstrable evidence, data, fact, or analysis. Practitioners across the country are increasingly finding this previously marginalized population deserving of more attention than they have in the past, where library spaces for young people have received less space and less designed attention than bathrooms. On the good side, however, this lack of evidence-based experimentation uh, with library space design opens up a pretty large field for people like Jeremy and myself. So a few years ago, and not unlike the way most research projects get started, uh, it bubbled up from something I'd been doing before. I, I resumed the advocacy for YA space that I had pioneered uh, at the LA Public Library in the 1990s and persuaded a panel of IMLS grant reviewers to give me a multi-grant year, uh, multi-grant, uh, multi-year grant to capture what was actually going on in the nation's YA library spaces. Together with three other researchers, and Dr. Kemp here today is among them, and 11 San Jose State LIS graduate research assistants, we asked five years worth of the most recent, uh, most recent and renovated libraries, nearly 800 nationally, to tell us what they were doing. Uh, 332 told us in survey responses, in video footage, and in data that we derived from virtual experience in Second Life. We even asked young people themselves to tell us what they thought about libraries, what, what libraries were doing. And we got back, what we got back represents the first empirical LIS data to support evidence-based library YA spaces. We've even, um, we've been successful too in disseminating our findings. I'll briefly excerpt from three recent studies today, but we've been published now in top tier scholarly journals, several practitioner journals. Just last week, for example, we learned that another article was accepted for public libraries and another yet is still under review with public libraries. And we presented or have forthcoming presentations at school, state, national, and even international conferences, both as scholars as well as graduate students. Our students are out presenting some of this material too. So this is a good example of how a team of scholars and students together have begun to systematically build our LIS knowledge base to fill a gaping hole 
and a, a historical gaping hole, too, in our daily practice. And for those of you not explicitly connected to serving young adults, I would urge you to consider how the questions and data we'll share with you today pertain to your own library and user populations. If you do, I believe you'll agree that IMLS is getting its money's worth out of our, our project. In terms of the quantitative study, while I do not intend to overwhelm you with the statistics that we captured from our first study, I do want to have you appreciate that we approached nearly 800 new and renovated libraries across the country and heard back from roughly 350 of them. That's a substantial number from which to draw insights, if not conclusions, about what libraries are currently offering the nation's young people. Our first study examined the role that youth participation played in the design of these new YA spaces. Libraries have for many years been touting the need to better involve youth in, in um, service development, and so it made sense to ask about the outcomes that libraries observed. In response, we developed our own Youth Participation Index, YPI, to quantify and assess the patterns we found. 19 of our survey's 30 questions cohered around the idea of youth participation. Among many factors, we asked about the degree to which YE ideas and direct advocacy contributed to the development and the design of the spaces, including the extent of uh, YE volunteering in them, the degree of employment that they experienced in them, the role that they may have played during an adv advisory board uh, capacity, and the degree to which they were actively involved in the, the space administration. Um, not surprisingly, libraries reported higher youth participation said that they achieved more successful places. So the more participation the young people had, the more that the, the staffs were, were pleased with the space's outcomes. Indeed, libraries with high YPA, YPI ratings reported service improvements across a wide range of outcomes, as well as higher staff satisfaction with the new spaces. To note only the highlights, libraries with higher YPA scores represented and reported more influence in attracting independent outside funding, greater input on YE space design, which oftentimes contributed to larger spaces, larger proportional spaces in the libraries. The square footage that we found that libraries were reporting for YE spaces was, across the country, 3%. 3%. Um, so libraries with higher YPIs also reported higher YA library use, of course. Decidedly less reliance on behavioral rules and concern for line of sight spatial arrangements and higher degrees of concern for libraries featuring more green construction. Young people cared about green construction. While I have uh, difficulty believing that libraries will cotton to claims about the reduced reliance on behavioral rules or the faith-based efficacy involved with line of sight arrangements, no matter how many hundreds of libraries we examine, the benefits of higher degrees of youth participation do clearly point to broad and improved service outcomes. After years of literature promoting youth participation, however, there were overall relatively few libraries to earn high YPI scores. At one end, 9% of our libraries reported no youth involvement at all, while 208 reported low scores, reporting from one to seven youth participation factors. Only 27 libraries among the 257 usable surveys, that's 11%, uh, reported or indicated that YEs played a substantial participatory role. Because researchers know that deriving analysis merely from self-reported surveys will often raise methodological questions, our second study, just uh, accepted for publication in public libraries, as I mentioned, involved distributing 25 uh, video cameras to libraries all over the country that had completed our, our online survey. We asked YE library staff, along with young adults, to record two to three minute video tours of their YA spaces. We asked them to narrate and document what they felt was most important to them. We received 42 videos back, 22 from librarians and 20 from young adults. We transcribed the narrations, we then coded them and analyzed them, and together these videos furnished a fairly crunchy insight into the thoughts, feelings, and meanings of librarians and their YA users. Although we asked for uh, their own responses, we were after a few things in particular. First, and different from the surveys, we asked that librarians and YAs themselves wanted to show us what they value. But more interesting yet, we wanted to see if these two groups agreed 
on what they felt was important? If so, what was it? And if not, what did they differ about? What we found was something that builds upon what we learned from our first study, that due to disconnects between staff and YAs, while there are similarities in what they found, there were also some very important differences. First, and not surprisingly, librarians often concentrated on discussing library materials and resources. YAs, on the other hand, emphasized their experiences during their library visits, indicating that they appreciate the library for resources, but they also want a social dimension of their experience in those spaces as well. Another interesting finding, which was slightly over one third of the librarians, about 36%, emphasized the notion for separation in, in terms of YA spaces from other places. Um, we all know that young adults want to be as far away from, as possible from children, right? Well, not so fast. We found that while 36% of the, um, the staff assumed that this is true, only 10%, 10 of the young adults expressed the desire for visual or physical separation from libraries, especially from children's spaces. Well, you can say that uh, they just forgot to mention it, or that if we'd asked them directly, they would tell us that they want separation. But also, I want you to remember that uh, we asked them to tell us what was important to them. And the separation thing didn't move the needle in terms of the YA register, while it did appear important to librarians. This apparent negligence of the YAs to emphasize spatial separation, however, makes sense if we take time to evaluate it. In many of our buildings, particularly in urban areas, where populations, of, uh, where population densities are high, or in areas where they're populated by poor or immigrant families, parents often send their kids to the library together, where the older kids take care of their younger siblings. If we interpret design through our own separation assumptions, then we are inadvertently placing undue role strain on these kids, either preventing the YAs from enjoying the YA spaces because they need to stay with their, the children, or saddling them with their younger siblings when they do visit their YA spaces. The point here is that when we drive our own unexamined assumptions through design, something which is as true for collection development or programming or outreach, we are possibly then inflicting barriers on our users and our service profiles. This might cause you to consider how your own assumptions operate in your own spaces. After looking at these broad strokes about youth participation and then the disagreement and agreements between librarians and young, young adults, we used our next study to drill down into one highly applicable and practical design concept emerging from both uh, parts of the surveys. The 257 usable online surveys that YAs returned from libraries across the country led us to detect a strong opinion pulse about the seemingly mundane and simple topic, seating. So our uh, third study simply asked, how can libraries improve seating for library users? The answer we found should not really surprise anybody, but at the outset, let's just set aside the fact that libraries have implemented their seating concepts and policies forever without any research or any evidence whatsoever. And these legacies beg questions about the unnecessary obstacles and postural limitations at play here. And this assumes that libraries have even, uh, that, uh, that libraries even offer YE seating, and most of them do not. <clears throat> so I mean, have you ever even, have you looked at uh, YE seating recently? I call that the information trough. Uh, um, there are three other insights that we got uh, actually from, from these surveys uh, that YE's told us about. One, they simply want a larger vocabulary of postural options. These things that we're sitting in here do not offer postural options. You do the sit down and shut up or you stand somewhere. Second, we learned from uh, these otherwise, um, the, we can learn from their otherwise, what I refer to as fugitive postures. We can look at how they sit when they're comfortable and derive some of those things. And third, a full third of them, given current choices like this, would rather just sit on the floor. In general, expanding the variety of seating opportunities and increasing their control over their own postural enactments remain potent features that libraries, even those with limited resources, can explore to radically improve spatial equity. In this study, we took the opportunity to help librarians better envision some of these other options, and so the study became more of a visual anecdote. I've already mentioned the lack of evidence surrounding library seating policies. One in particular is the ubiquitous one butt to a chair policy. 
We can further explore this issue in Q&A if you want, for reasons against or you know, all of that stuff. But the fact of the matter is that there's no evidence supporting any claims whatsoever about this ubiquitous policy. Further, young people demonstrate in many other venues the capacity to thrive, when working, uh, thrive while working together, and yet libraries turn a blind eye. The best insight we gain from these young voices, however, is a desire for a wider array of postural choices. The information trough just doesn't cut it. Of course, these are not new ideas about the ways young people and their bodies work. We encounter youth every day in every place enacting postures that make them comfortable. Libraries, among other institutions, however, simply ignore, or worse, punish them. Here are a few historical images of, the, of young people making themselves comfortable. You may well recognize or even remember preferring uh, these kind of uh, uh, floor interpretations and using stairs as viable seating options. And if not, then I'm confident you will recognize this. <laughs> From uh, the 1985 uh, John Hughes classic film, The Breakfast Club. Young people from explicitly different backgrounds are depicted as making common convivial space, not only on the floor that they reappropriate, enacting a kind of consecrated community council, but it's the floor of their library, their school library. Note the postural individuality and variety depicted even as the group conven convenes on an open floor without furniture. We actually coined a name uh, for this, demo uh, this democracy of the floor. We call it tapidotasis, derived from the Greek tapido, which is floor, and tasis, which means oriented or seeking, floor seeking. Here are a few images of young people, um, even in institutional settings, demonstrating how they can comfortably thrive in a variety of floor configurations. The question that may come quickly to your mind is how can libraries realistically adopt this tapidotasis thing? Well, it's not difficult to facilitate floor or floor for proximate seating options, particularly if these notions are integrated into design. This is a modest two-tier carpet-covered platform in a small branch library. We can discuss its assets and liabilities later in Q&A if you like. Here's a more sophisticated interpretation of platform seating. One, promoting the postural liberation from task chairs and wooden tables. Note the two Ottomans on casters also. Finally, here's the best flowering of a YA space in recently constructed county library. Here are the architects, one of the, our grant partners I hasten to add, incorporates a wide variety of seating options, including a three-tiered carpet-covered riser integrated into a rather small space, but yet affording all of the features and qualities that libraries have told us in so many ways and for so long that they want. Here, young people get options. They get variety, flexibility, and freedom, all without being turned into postural fugitives. These contrasting images best represent what we're learning about seating. So here uh, is where I believe we are on this issue of YA space equity in libraries. On the one hand, it's true that libraries have become increasingly aware of the importance to offer young adult spaces of their own. Today, unlike as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, new libraries will at least gesture toward representing YAs in their designs and floor plans. On the other hand, new and recently renovated buildings also unfortunately exhibit a continuing inability to develop evidence-based practice or respond to the aesthetic postural preferences expressed by this user group. We love to talk about computer and learning labs, uh, learning commons is a common uh, phrase we use today, and the more recent one you know we may recognize as maker spaces. But we have no evidence to support claims of best practices. We have no knowledge base or even criteria from which to draw uh, in terms of establishing or, de or delivering demonstrable successful spaces. In most instances, the profession unreflectively, uh, our unreflective processes and legacy privileging of collections continue um, at the expense of creating accommodating, hospitable, equitable, and purpose-built environments for young people. It should be obvious, though, that without practice-relevant research, library solutions will remain ad hoc. 
By the way, we promised the IMLS, our granting agency, that we would keep all of our studies raw data open and accessible to the public. So if you're interested in digging into several thousand survey responses, video transcripts, and other fun stuff like that, we've mounted it all on our youthfacts.org. It's a project that I've been developing with another one of our project researchers, Dr. Mike Mails from San Francisco's Center for Juvenile and Criminal Justice. On a broader register, like all public places, libraries demonstrate who counts and what activities matter in a community. Libraries as public spaces represent a unique civic experience for young people. American libraries, however, often trumpet these democratic ideals but do not always execute them in practice. Still, Although commercial interests continually attempt to intensify their profiles, public libraries remain rather free, um, fee-free and essentially commercial-free environments. They facilitate rare spaces for intellectual exploration and offer a range of activities and opportunities to access rich and well-organized informational and cultural resources. They provide connections to professionals trained to help them access information allow for observation and interaction within, within an age-integrated community, and thus facilitate the development of social capital. And in the face of the culture's increasing privatized public experience, libraries offer youth from poor material circumstances access to well-maintained public environments. The library's physical plant thus represents valuable and unique spatial capital for youth. Library designs that include the actual physical realities and preferences of young people will better express these values in their public spaces. It's been a cliche for quite some time that YA experience is the bellwether of coming, coming technological change. Indeed, it serves as the canary in the library coal mine for experimenting with uh, social software, gaming, virtual experience, among others. But what we've discovered in our examination of library spaces for young adults is just how poor our general knowledge, is ba our general knowledge base is about designing and evaluating library spaces for all users. In many ways, the learning that we're conducting with this particular project about gathering and analyzing and um, uh, spatial data is highly pertinent and applicable to all types of libraries and almost all library users. So here, our work could really serve as a model. We were asked today, and Mark wanted to make sure that we were sensitive to the fact that not all of you are YA librarians, so I wanted to make sure that I, I ended with a, just a few concluding comments that are more general. Uh, when asked informed questions, library users demonstrate awareness of the importance of libraries as public spaces and are capable of offering insightful and practical solutions to address design challenges. Uh, time after time, I hear librarians say that they asked young people what they wanted in the spaces, and of course, the things that young people say they wanted are completely impossible for libraries. So they were not asked informed questions. Librarians need to prepare better to engage spatial design. When we asked librarians how they entered into these new building processes, they demonstrated a stunning lack of curiosity and preparation for engaging design professionals. At a time when libraries face keen competition from uh, technological and institutional transformations in the storage of and access to information, we must consistently seek ways to prove their value in contributing to the well-being of our communities. In being more responsive to what users want, in deriving such, in such insights as we can from observing and engaging them, uh, we can achieve higher degrees of comfort in, for them in our library buildings. And then finally, in order to achieve these goals, libraries need and should demand practice-relevant research, the kind of stuff that we've been doing, practice-relevant research on spaces and fa facility designs and evaluation procedures. Um, and this includes what architects call post-occupancy -occup studies. After a building is done and it's up and running for about a year, you should go back in and examine it and, and, and get your, your users to, to give you feedback on how you need to change it. So that's about as much detail as we have time for today. Um, thank you for inviting us to share our work with you. And I'm hoping that uh, we'll have some good time for some question and answers after, after Jeremy's uh, presentation. Thank you.